The fundamental question that Wolf starts out trying to answer is why have there been so few women writers? Like, why is it the case that when you go to the library and you look through the shelves, most of the things that are published are written by men? And the conclusion she arrives at is, throughout history, patriarchal society has subordinated women and totally devalued their work. She tells us on page 33, an alien could show up on this planet, pick up a newspaper, and realize that men are in charge, right? So, um... You know, how how do we get more women writers is the question she's trying to answer. Why have there, there been so few of them and how can we get more of them? And the solution is really simple, in theory. And I love this book because she tells us right up front on page four what we what we need. A woman must have money in a room of her own if she is to write fiction, Wolf says. Great, wonderful, end of the book, right? Not quite. That leaves the problem of the true nature of woman and the true nature of fiction unsolved. So she's like, sorry, I got to keep talking. But, um, you know, what we need at, at the core is if we want women to, to be writers, we, they need money and they need a room. I will say one thing about the weird narrative structure here. So um, Virginia Woolf starts the, the text speaking as Virginia Woolf, and then she totally shifts into this weird third person narrator um and i call her I, I guess i refer to her most often as mary Benton. um she's generally i guess we assume that she's speaking for all women generally so um she's first she's virginia wolf speaking for virginia wolf then she's mary Benton speaking for the the average woman um you know, so when she says, here, here then was I, call me Mary Benton, Mary Seton, call me whatever you want, it doesn't matter, it's because she's trying to represent all women to herself. And it creates this kind of neat trilogue between Wolf and all women and the reader specifically, which, you know, so if, if I refer to Wolf or Mary Benton um, interchangeably, just don't, please don't nitpick about that. So Mary Benton starts talking, and she starts talking about being invited to lunch at a men's college. And um, she, she calls it Oxbridge, which is just this smashing together of Oxford and Cambridge, right, the two most famous colleges in the English-speaking world. Um, so she's invited to lunch at Oxbridge and dinner at a women's college that she calls Furnham College. And uh, she notices these really stark differences between the meals that she served at the colleges, and, and this is really significant. So when she goes to lunch at the men's college at Oxbridge, she notes how well the men are dining. And this is not like a holiday, it's just a Tuesday. It's just some ordinary lunch. But they're eating partridges um, with a retinue of sauces and salads and in a confection which rose all sugar from the waves. And to call this confection pudding uh, would be an insult, you know. It's, it's so delightful. Uh, they're drinking wine at lunch, right? Yellow and, and red wine. And the, the glasses are emptied and filled. And so that's her lunch. And then she goes to dinner at the women's college and she says, we had soup. It was plain soup on a plain plate, some beef with some greens and potatoes, some prunes and custard, some biscuits and cheese, and they literally passed a water jug around. And that was it. There was no fanfare, no fancy food. The meal was just over. And so she says, you know, one of the things you can tell by looking at these two meals is that the financial situation of men and women are is, is very different, right? And, you know, she says, one cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well. And the point she's trying to make by illustrating the these two meals and showing the differences is that women have always been poor. Um, so she's she goes next to the British Museum and she's thinking, why, why are men, why do men drink water, wine and women drink water? Why is one sex prosperous while the other is poor? And she she then, you know starts thinking like, well, what effect has poverty had on the writing of fiction? And she eventually, you know, arrives at the question, what conditions are necessary for the creation of a work of art? So she's, all of these gears in her mind are churning. Um, she's looking at stuff in the British Museum, and she's she's looking at books, and she, she asks the reader, have you any notion how many books are written about women in the course of one year? Have you any notion how many are written by men? 
Women, are you aware that you are perhaps the most discussed animal in the universe? See, again, it's like women are a mystery that people, that men have to try to figure out. So we, we dissect them and, and discuss them in, our, in these books. So she's at the British Museum to do research. And she's looking through all these books and she comes across all of these differing opinions about the nature and status of women that are, and they're all written by men. So you should look at some of these. You can find them between page 28 and 30. Um, and she assigns a random opinion uh, to Professor Von X, just some random dude who's writing about women. And she she has a theory about him. She makes this conclusion about him where she, she realizes that he's really angry. Um, and these opinions that he's writing about women are coming from this place of anger, she says. They're written in the red light of emotion rather than the white light of truth. What are the men angry about, she wonders. She figures out that it's fear. So the way that she constructs this picture is that women have provided this essential psychological function to men since the beginning of time. They have been there for men to have someone to feel superior to, right? So think about um, think about men and, you know, there's always going to be someone taller than you, faster than you, smarter than you, right? So there's always going to be somebody who's better than you, but if you take the entire class of women and construct them as inferior, then you can always feel better about yourself than somebody else, right? So you always, men can always have women to sort of compare themselves to and say, well, at least I'm not a woman, at least I'm not that. So men have realized that women, the inferior, the inferiority of women actually provides this really essential psychological function and it gives them self-confidence. And that's what you get when you believe that you're superior to other people. It's not that the professors who are writing about women are so concerned with the fact that women are inferior, but they are more concerned about their, like, establishing their own superiority. And that's been preserved throughout time by the, the, the viewpoint of men. I don't want you to get too, uh, you know, psychological about this. Um, Wolf is kind of writing in the tradition of, of Freudian psychology, which we'll look at a little later on in the semester, so don't sort of dissect this too much from a psychological standpoint, but um, this is her theory, and she says that women become the mirrors through which men view themselves. So men define themselves by their relationship to, to the other. This is really similar to Du Bois's view about the... Um, the double consciousness, right? Remember when the African American can't see himself through his own eyes, he can only like judge himself through the eyes of the white man. It's the same thing. Women um, can only see themselves through the eyes of men because that's the way society has constructed them. Okay, so uh, we'll leave the psychology behind for a second, and then Wolf uh, Betton starts talking about an aunt of hers who died and left her an inheritance. And her inheritance uh, is what allowed her to become a writer, to, to write and to thrive. And it wasn't much. It's not like a million dollars a year. It's 500 pounds. That's not, you know, that's a really modest sum. Uh, but Wolf's, uh, Wolf or Batten says, you know, if you took this money that I was left, my inheritance and the right to vote, the money was actually more important to me. It seemed way more important because nobody could take it from me. Food, house, and clothing are mine forever. So I think that's really controversial, right, for her to say that money is more important than the right to vote. I think that Du Bois would have something really, um, you know, negative to say about that. But what it all boils down to is that Wolf thinks that intellectual freedom depends upon material things. And... Women have always been poor, not just for the last 200 years, but from the beginning of time they have been poor. So women have not been able to be artists, to be writers, to be successful, because they have never had financial independence. So, you know, when you look at... When you look at the three texts of the Communist Manifesto, the Souls of Black Folk, and uh, Room of One's Own together, I think you can see this really interesting line of thought um, come through about money. And um, so it's a really it, it's interesting to kind of compare and contrast and see what Marx and Wolf would say about Wolf's emphasis. Marx and Du Bois would say about Wolf's emphasis on money um, and whether she's right about it. So 
for example, Marx might say, well, of course she's right because we live under capitalism and, and that's why money is, is a requirement. So, um, you know, those are things that you should look at. So I'll stop this one here and then we'll talk about women in literature.